Well, we will, as I mentioned before, provide you with this data. But as you can see, it's very important to highlight that 25% of hate crimes are particularly violent. And there's a, an enormous problem of lack of reporting. We see this between the difference in the numbers of official sources and the real sources, which is why we are aware that we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg, because according to the data of the Agency of Fundamental Rights, nine out of 10 of those who have been victims of hate aggressions and hate attacks or discrimination attacks do not report these attacks, or they either don't feel like victims or they feel that by reporting those attacks or that hate, it could just worsen the situation, stigmatizing them even more or becoming victims again. This phenomenon of, of lack of reporting is what in France is called, and we will see this in the next image, this is called the black numbers or black figures. It's that gap between the cases reported and the real situation. Let's not forget something that's very important for the future. If these cases are not reported, there will be no sentence, and therefore we are contributing to impunity. There are, as I mentioned before, enormous gaps of knowledge on what is happening out there. And it's a very large area that leads to persecution, to stigmatization, that we consider out of our radar because it's not reflected in the official data of the OSCD. And even civil society has difficulties to obtain this information. We see this attacks against people due to their physical aspect. We've even seen discrimination due to COVID. Societies normalize certain conducts and identities and create new ways of stigmatizing or, or reactivate old ways of stigmatizing. Javier Resaca, a dear researcher, carried out a study on hate crimes against the state of law, which is another element that's important within this context. Anyway, what we see is that racism and xenophobia are the main catalyzers of hate crimes, the most severe hate crimes. And the trend indicates a growth of intolerance, especially in Spain, there's a growth of intolerance. As we see, there's a re-victimization of the victims of terrorism or the continued existence of racism in Italy or the anti-Semitism in Germany or France. We also see these incidents of hate against people for their sexual orientation or transphobia. When we when we've seen that there were 41 cases in 2016, and in 2018, only two years later, there were a thousand cases. Finishing off, these hate speeches can lead to severe violations of human rights. Jurisprudence, jurisprudence sorry, establishes what is legal and what is illegal, but we have to take on the situation, presenting a proposal to the European Commission to fight against these hate crimes and speeches. We are also very interested to hear in what the Europol Internet Reference Unit could, does and how it contributes to detecting and investigating malicious content on in the internet and social media. We see there's growing concern on how to strictly respect fundamental rights and a democratic ecosystem, but we also have to make sure that this is not poisoning the social and political debate, which is why Fabian and myself from Renew, we wanted to create this debate and make our contributions in a sensible, realistic, and ambitious way. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the Vice President, Vera Jurova, who cannot be here with us live, but was uh, kind enough to send us a video. So please, here we go.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to your webinar and thank you, Maite, for this initiative. Hatred and hate crimes are increasing at an alarming rate. The situation has worsened during the pandemic. We have seen a surge in hateful conspiracy theories, anti-democratic narratives and floods of hatred online. Hate speech and polarizing narratives present challenges for our democracy. This polarization affects citizens' participation and can distort the terms of debate and the outcomes of political processes. Our debate has less and less common middle ground. On the contrary, people are increasingly locking themselves in their bubbles on the opposite sides of this debate. These phenomena have intensified as the debate has increasingly shifted online. Racist and xenophobic hate crime and hate speech are illegal under EU law. In order to address the loopholes in the protection, the Commission will present a new initiative in December to extend the current list of so-called EU crimes in the treaty to all forms of hate crime and hate speech. This initiative will create the legal base to strengthen the EU's criminal law response to hate speech. This would allow the Commission, in a second stage, to propose a strong common legal framework to tackle hate speech and hate crime across the EU. At the same time, we are enforcing the existing framework decision on racism and xenophobia through dialogue with national authorities and, where necessary, infringement procedures. So far, we have launched infringement proceedings against 10 member states. We are also implementing effective policy measures. We started working with voluntary measures since 2016 with several social media platforms and civil society. The Code of Conduct on Countering Illegal Hate Speech Online has made fast progress. Yet, as confirmed from the Facebook whistleblower Francis Haugen, there is room to improve content moderation and to address risks of amplifying illegal content, but also address algorithms causing harm to our democratic processes. The Digital Services Act proposal introduces a series of measures to reduce the prevalence of illegal content online. Users and trusted flaggers will be empowered to report illegal content in an easy and effective way. Very large online platforms will need to fix their weaknesses for amplifying harmful behaviors, in particular against vulnerable groups. We have also proposed measures to increase transparency and mechanisms for users to complain against the decisions of the platforms on content moderation. And, importantly, these horizontal rules against illegal content are carefully calibrated and accompanied by robust safeguards to respect freedom of expression and an effective right of redress. Ladies and gentlemen, we all have to show determination to use all our tools to fight hate in Europe. The Conference on the Future of Europe is one of them. It is a platform where we can together shape our responses. It creates the space of civil and vibrant exchange, which is what we need to revitalize our democracies and respond to polarization and hatred. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you fruitful discussion today. Bien, pues eso vamos a hacer, tener un debate muy fructífero. Very well, thank you very much. That's what we will try to have a very fruitful debate. And we are accompanied by three experts that uh, will guide us with all of their knowledge and their work so that we will have a very fruitful debate. We are going to listen to Stefano Valenti, Chief of the Unit No Hate Speech in Cooperation, 
of the DG of Democracy of the Council of Europe, Esteban Ibarra, President of the Movement Against Intolerance and Activist for Human Rights, and Alberto García Morales, Chief of, Uni of the Unit of uh, the EU um, Internet Referral Unit. First of all, we are going to listen to Stefano Palenti. He will have about 10 minutes. And he has gathered an amazing amount of experience in this field. So, Mr. Valenti, we are looking forward to your presentation. You have the floor. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Valenti, yes. Hello. Do you hear me? Very well, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Very well, sir. Can you hear me? Okay, good. I go ahead. Very good. So, um, uh, greetings from Strasbourg, uh, which is the uh, Council of Europe um, um, headquarter. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to can uh, to contribute uh, to this um, important event, which I think that uh, focus on a very um, um, uh, phenomenon, uh, which is uh, the, 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 the combating hate in a more polarized uh, world. So uh, I, in, during my 10 minutes, I will try to um, um, give some hints to the notion of uh, um, hate speech in a polarized world, um, and also um, what can be do uh, can be done to 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 to, to counter um, hate speech in uh, the present situation, in particular a speech online, and what can be the Council of Europe contribution to this uh, um, uh, to address this phenomenon. So. Um, uh, first of all, the notion of polarized world. I think that uh, the notion, this notion is not new because uh, uh, splitting is always easier than lumping, than putting together. But I think that the result of dividing uh, into two completely opposing groups uh, is always the same. Nobody wins and everybody loses. Um, what makes today the world uh, more polarized? Um, I think that it was already mentioned uh, in the introduction, fear of immigration, economic crisis, and lately the COVID pandemic have created a fertile ground of divided society. Unfortunately, populism is often the most immediate reply, um, but it's, I think, the wrong reply uh, and uh, at the best, a short-term reply. Um, I will concentrate on hate speech when I see that uh, others are um, uh, will deal with the hate crime. So the notion of hate speech, uh, I think that it is based on a similar polarized dynamic of, of making to believe that a person of, or a group of person are not only different from the others, but even superior to others and thus justifying hatred, incit incitement to discrimination, and here the link with hate crime. I would also underline that hate speech and hate crime are not the same even if they are linked. So I would recommend when we, we deal with these two phenomena to distinguish, although there is a logical and unfortunately temporary link between hate, propagating hate, and then um, uh, making, uh, committing a crime with a biased motivation. The importance is because the first hate speech is an abuse of a fundamental right. So we have either a fundamental right or a violation of the dignity of the victim through the incitement of discrimination, the incitement to violence. While hate crime in a way, unfortunately, is more simple. We have already a crime, a violent crime, and I think that the hate component makes this crime 
more dangerous and therefore it has to be punished uh, uh, more seriously. But I think that these imply that against hate speech, the criminal sanction is the most extreme, the most rare of the sanctions. While in hate crime, we have the criminal sanctions as the only or the main way of addressing this phenomenon. So why hate speech is even more dangerous today? I mean, it's clear, it has been already mentioned, there is the use of hate speech, which is increasing, especially through internet, which is magnifying its impact. So we are in an era where hate speech uh, through internet guarantee a maximum impact with the, 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 the advantage not to be known, to be anonymous. So what can be done to counter this phenomenon of hate speech offline and online? So I think that here there is not a consensus among all the states and also between continent. I think that approach of United States, it's mainly that you combat hate speech with more speech, with counter speech. And this is uh, a way to protect uh, the abuse of countering hate speech by violating the freedom of speech. We have seen also that uh, um, um, uh, Commissioner um, Jourova said that self-regulation and code of conduct are also important means, which basically are self-imposed rules uh, to, to regulate uh, um, illegal content in the, um, uh, in the, especially in the internet. And then we have the most serious civil and administrative liability and criminalization of its most extreme manifestation. Okay, so when we speak about uh, hate speech online, I think that it's quite important that the responsibility is not only upon the haters, mm -hmm. but also on internet service provider, web fora and host, online intermediaries and social media platform. So I give you a few examples of, of how states reacted to this. Um, the most famous uh, act is the German, uh, German federal government um, uh, network enforcers act, which is in 2017 is a kind of reaction to a lack of efficient self-regulation self from the internet industry. On the other side, we have the EU code of conduct for internet industry. And this is, uh, uh, it's part of this shift to in, make um, more uh, effective the self-regulation, the code of conduct. Um, the Fran France, for example, tried to uh, follow the, 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 the German example with the Avia law, uh, which uh, uh, takes the name of the main, uh, uh, the main legislator, the, the parliamentarian who drafted this law. But here uh, we had uh, a change because a constitutional court um, uh, judgment. And also here we see uh, what is uh, the, the weight of freedom of expression. So one thing that I would like to underline and uh, in this uh, short presentation is that anti-hate speech measure should not be used to restrict uh, freedom of expression. And this was mentioned before, even the most shocking uh, expression, which when it is uh, um, in the realm of freedom of expression, of criticism, should not be censored. So I think that here we have the difficulties of addressing hate speech because we have in between the protection of the fundamental uh, freedom, freedom of expression, on the other hand, the protection of uh, 
um, the dignity, the equality of all individuals. Um, what is the Council of Europe contribution to addressing hate speech? I think that uh, the Council of Europe, although um, he's um, uh, composed by a number of Europe, uh, all the European Union member states and beyond that uh, uh, up to 47 member states, I think that the main added value is about standards. Uh, we, for, first of all, the European Court of Human Rights and its case law, which has addressed a number of time issues pertaining to hate speech and hate crime. But there are also monitoring bodies like the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, which is monitoring policies and the application of law concerning uh, the addressing in, uh, hate speech and also hate crime. Now, in the context of enlarging the list of EU crimes to also hate speech and hate crime, and most likely the initial work of the European Commission, I think that there are synergies between the EU institutions, including the EU Parliament, and the Council of Europe. For example, I think that the, the work of uh, the preparatory work of the EU institution will be about definition of hate speech, definition of hate crime. As we know, there is not a consensus on the definition and many international uh, national law, they have different definition of these two phenomena. I think that this is a work that is, 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 is is in the process to be done by some uh, committee of minister of the Council of Europe recommendation, which will deal with these two phenomena. Now, I think that uh, I don't want to uh, steal time from other speakers and from the debates. I would like only to conclude with the, um, a reference, since here we are in the realm of uh, a, a parliamentary assembly, which is the European Parliament, I think that the importance of the role of politicians in addressing hate speech in particular. I think that politicians have a particular important responsibility in regard, uh, in this regard, because of their capacity to exercise influence over a wide audience. Now, this influence can be used in a good way or in a bad way. And both of them, they are terribly effective. So in the, in the positive way, I think that politicians should refrain to use speech which is offensive, speech which incite discrimination, which incite uh, um, stereotyping, which incite polarization of uh, different groups. Unfortunately, in all the European unions and not only in the, all the European Union member states, this became, we just uh, heard before, a kind of normality to use this speech in order to gain immediate votes and gain uh, mm, uh, influence. But I think that in the long term, this uh, kind of tactics is very dangerous. So we need more politicians who condemn a speech and explained also, not with the, the same speech of hate speech, but with a different kind of communication, why hate speech is wrong, why it's based on false information. So there is a kind of learning on a different kind of communication, which use in a way the tactic of the hate speech for its immediate effect, but in a different way. So I think that this is very important. And I think that uh, this initiative that you are having today goes to uh, this direction. I'm ready later on to reply to questions, but I think that I will stop here. Thank you very much.
Pues muchísimas gracias por su excelente intervención. Thank you very much indeed for your excellent presentation. You have given us a great, great framework and indeed you point to the importance of, of the politician's role that can be done for good or worse. Those who have more power have more responsibility, more accountability, and we are trying to be precise when we talk about such a sensitive issue, which is very necessary for the quality of democracy. You have paved the way for the presentation of our next speaker, Esteban Ibarra, President of the Movement Against Intolerance and Activist for Human Rights since the 70s. He's going to talk to us about the universal dimension of human rights in an empirical way and hands-on way. He knows about all the incidents and the ways to stigmatize people, especially in Spain. So without further ado, Mr. Esteban Ibarra, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Maite. And thank you, Fabien and the Renew Group. And good afternoon to all of you, Stefano, and all of you that are following us and accompanying us in this event. The first consideration here is that hate speech and hate, and hate crime is not new. This is enshrined in the history of humankind. This is a very important starting point. It seems that we are discovering this now. But as Maite said, I've been a victim of uh, hate crime in the 70s. But this concept didn't exist before. And of course, there were this type of uh, crimes, hate crimes in, in the past century, in the one before, and so on. We can talk about genocide as well. And we can also refer ourselves to the context of the Holocaust. So when do we hear this term for the first time at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the year 2000? Towards the end of the 90s, this uh, concept is uh, identified. In 1997, hate, hate speech is defined. The European Court of Human Rights uses this term when talking about hate speech as a speech motivated on intolerance, based on intolerance. And the OC, OSCE, as Stefano explained, he explained the difference between the US approach and the European approach. And at the OSCE, because the US and Canada are there, they do not accept this term, hate speech, as such. They make a definition of hate speech and hate crime. But this is a new debate that will visit the European Union since the year 2000. We shouldn't be too ambitious and trying to uh, define to the last detail what these two terms mean because we wouldn't agree. But we do have to agree upon a concept, concept we can work upon, a concept that defines a phenomenon. That's essential because what we want to do is to identify this phenomenon so that each country can then develop a legislation in accordance, a series of uh, measures and policies. So following this framework, the first thing that we would have to look at is what is the reach and the nature of the concept of hate crime. Let me specify something. Generally, especially in Spain, there was a, a, a term that was established that was the speech of hate. But that, that, that's a mistake. It's a linguistic mistake. It's not the speech of hate because hate is not the one that makes the speech. 
It's hate speech. So we can't we can't speak about speech of hate or crime of hate. It has to be hate speech, hate crime with a specific concept. There's no subject. It's just hate speech or hate crime is a subject per se. So this linguistic nuance is very important. Then we have to see what the nature of it is and what the reach of it is. We're always talking about racism, xenophobia, hate against women, or physical aspects, dysphobia, autophobia, disabilities, you name it. The legislation on a European level refers 21 factors of discrimination. Then it adds a general clause for any other circumstance, whether it be personal or social. This is very important. This is very important because it opens the possibilities. In Spain, in our legal framework, in our criminal code, in 1995, we have a clause, but it is exclusive. And it includes 15 specific factors. In Belgium, they have 19. In Canada, they have other factors that are enshrined in the law. So we have to see what this concept covers. In some debates, what I hear is, no, we have to talk about racism and xenophobia. But I think we're excluding so much more, and therefore we're excluding all the victims. The victims cannot count on the same type of protection if that specific crime is not reflected in the law. As Maite was saying, I have worked with many, many victims since I started working with this uh, with this subject. But well, I've been working against this problem for for even more years. But well, I started protecting specific victims uh, for the past thirty years, and I've provided support to over two thousand six hundred victims, not specifically only of racism and xenophobia. There's also homophobia, but also against physical aspects. Nobody stops to analyze whether that person was selected due to their physical aspects. In Spain, the, the person was killed, and they considered that his life was not worth anything because he was fat, and he was he, he was stabbed 24 times and killed others because they're punks or because uh, they belong to a different sports club and th those people are not even identified further they, they just look at them and register and classify them as this person is not worth life so i think in the european charter of human rights and the treaties of the european union in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all the international treaties on human rights have to consider this concept in an open way. So any numerous clauses, any closed concept concept is exclusive. And that, that can be negative. Some people argue that if we if we have an open taxation, well, it, it might stop working. But no, I, I disagree. The taxation taxonomy has to be based on the action, on the motivation behind that action. And without excluding specific factors. Basically, it has to boil down to a common hatred, no matter what that where that hatred comes from. And basically, it, it can be translated to intolerance. And we have to identify what political measures we have or tools we have. The European Council in the 80s held up to three plenary sessions to speak about intolerance. And then it was the UN year that led to a declaration in 1995 signed by all the uh, leaders and presidents of States. Then we have the Council of Europe in 97, the European Court of Human Rights. So then 
we have to see why intolerance is is a sibling of racism and xenophobism and homophobia. Basically, it's the rejection and lack of respect of the other due to their human nature. And this derives from the, the same principle of intolerance. So basically, the dignity of that other of the, is not recognized. So what we have to protect from a legal point of view is dignity. And that is reflected on the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. And it also has to protect the fundamental freedoms and rights that have been violated precisely due to that human condition, to that human nature of the individual. So what conducts should follow based on this enormous list of behaviors? Well, stigmatization, segregation, ostracizing, discrimination, hate crime, hate speech, but also crimes against humanity, also crimes against humanity. And therefore we would have a, a, an image, a clear situation with many causes and many expressions. Well, having that, if we can establish a common message, then we might have a shot at it. If we, and this is what we, we were already talking about in 1995. If we don't agree upon the terms, we're not going to get very far. Finally, I would like to specify that this is transcendental for a victim. If that victim is excluded from this protection framework, we're sending the wrong message. Firstly, for the victim that suffers, for other possible victims, for the family members, for society per se, that is allowing that part of the society to be segregated from this protection. And that goes against the, hum the universal declaration of human rights. That's why it's called universal, because it should cover all people, no matter how and where. In fact, the OSCE declaration considers this a criminal crime. But in some countries, a woman can be lapidated, and that's perfectly legal. And you can throw a person off of a building because they're homosexual. That's not illegal either. I think the European Union has to highlight this element of universality and then call upon all countries, all nations to defend this universal element because that's the only way we can defend the victims and therefore the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Otherwise, the victim is not only going to suffer because in the future, we will be fighting to see what elements are included in that list and therefore what elements or factors are protected and which are not. In my country, ideology, for example, is a factor that is worth being protected. But then there are some who are insisting that we have to eliminate ideology. If we're talking about universal rights, we have to include all factors that lead to that behavior. I think this is very dangerous because we all know that one of the behaviors could leave, lead to crimes against humanity. Hate crimes, a specific hate crime or, or hate crime from an organization, which is also important, have many faces. Sometimes it can be terrorist, identify terrorist objectives such as Doya, well, well, in Spain, we have uh, ETA, that was one of the main terrorist organizations that carried out hate crimes in Spain. Well, I think I'm going to stop here. But I think it's important to highlight the universal component, how we have to protect all victims. Because otherwise, considering all the declarations, charters, international agreements, these would not have any weight because we'd be losing the universal component of human rights so that no one, no one, no one is left behind. Thank you.
Thank you very much, dear Esteban. The element of intolerance is very clear and how human dignity is that legal aspect that we have to protect through the all these international declarations, charters, on fundamental rights, as well as the, the need to protect all individuals and not leave anyone behind, not leave anyone unprotected. And we need also to make sure that societies evolve in this direction and to fight against polarization because the, the damaged human dignity is the first element we have to work on. We have to make sure that those hearts that have become cold as stone become soft again, giving back the dignity to those people who have been deprived of it. And now let's focus on the theory, from the theory, sorry, to the practical aspect on what happens on a daily basis in the large intervention units that fight against malicious content in on the internet and in social media. We've heard how these hostile speeches have already existed, but now in modern times, thanks to the arrival of internet and, and the new systems that we can use to control internet, we can fight against malicious messages and how we can avoid this malicious content to be distributed and influence and promote bad conduct. So now I would like to mention the work carried out by Europol, which is uh, very interesting. We have to work on these two levels through legislation, but also in this modern 21st society, we have to work on a practical level. And we have the luck to have uh, Alberto Garcia Morales, the chief of the Europol, European Union internal referral units and well, they basically focus on removing inappropriate content and I hope that terrorist content can be removed immediately and all the member states can contribute to fighting against that type of content and we can contribute on an operational level, starting with fighting against the hate, which is the motivation that leads to terrorism. So thank you very much. We are expected to hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and presentation, Maite. Good afternoon to everyone. First, the, uh, in Europol, we usually use English as a working language. So first of all, I would like to Thank you the the opportunity uh, to speak about uh, Europol's uh, role in this uh, in this area. It's a, a privilege to to have uh, to participate in this discussion with uh, you all today. So every year, uh, Europol produced the EU terrorism situation and trend report called the uh, TSAT, which provides a view on the terrorism situation in the EU the year before. This TSAT report is based predominantly on the information officially contributed to Europol by EU member states. In addition, a number of Europol's cooperation partners are invited to provide information on terrorism situation in their respective countries. Right-wing terrorism and extremism feature prominently in the 2021 TSAT report puts right-wing terrorism in the, content, in the context of the spread of narratives of hate. Right-wing extremist ideologies feed on a range of hateful subcultures commonly fighting back against diversity in society and equal rights of minorities. Racist behavior, authoritatism, xenophobia, misogyny and hostility to LGBTQ communities, as well as immigration, are common attitudes among right-wing extremists. Furthermore, three terrorist attacks in France, including the beheading of a school teacher in Conflans on 16 of October 2020, following an online hate campaign linked to the cartoons, occurred in the context of a strong anti-French mobilization. Europol closely monitors developments in the EU member states related to the threat posed by all forms of terrorism and violent extremism covered by our mandate. The non-violent expression of right-wing and left-wing political views are not part of Europol's mandate. 
Furthermore, we support and aim to strengthen action by the competent authorities of the member states related to investigations into politically or ideologically motivated violent stress, extremism and terrorism in all its forms. So far, Europol could receive data and provide operational support on hate crimes falling under the area of racism and xenophobia in the framework of the analysis project dedicated to non-jihadist terrorism activities called Analysis Project Dolphin. Having said that, most of hate crimes reported to Europol fall Mr. Garcia, the right wing Mr. Garcia, excuse me, around 90%. Excuse me, Mr. Garcia. I have to mention that while the Mr. Garcia, could, Mr. Garcia states, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Mr. Garcia. Differences excuse between me? the legal definitions of racism and xenophobia in member states lead to different criminal procedures, thus influencing both the situational overview and the support that Europol Señor can provide Garcia. for investigations. Last year, Mr. Garcia, Mr. Garcia, of the Council of the EU, Europol coordinated a joint action day against hate speech on the internet in November 2020. Ten member states took part in this operation, the first of its kind. Law enforcement authorities rated 144 locations and interrogated 96 individuals in relation to offenses such as dissemination of racist and xenophobic hate speech, calls to violence and violence and incitement to comment offenses. I am, should I interrupt? Is the signal okay? Can you please, can you please switch to the English channel because the Spanish people don't 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 hear it don't hear the interpretation because you're using the spanish it's everything okay now apologies for uh, my compatriots i hope it's uh, all well uh, now so going on for this uh, joint action day about uh, hate speech uh, online the participating countries assessed the action day as an important sign of shared opposition to hate and incitement on the internet. Europol can continue to play a key role in sharing and helping to coordinate member states initiatives in this area. In fact, many EU member states call upon Europol to play a strong coordination role in organizing action days at EU level, aiming to target and dismantle right-wing violent extremist and terrorist organizations. The role of social media as a vehicle of hate speech, radicalization and terrorism was also highlighted in the discussions organized in December 2020 by Europol and the German presidency with the EU police chiefs, as well as Commissioner Johansson on common challenges to protect and ensure the efficacy and readiness of police forces in responding to evolving threats. Fighting hate speech online was identified as a priority by this forum. Europol's EU Internet Referral Unit has demonstrated its added value in combating illegal content online and in particular as regards to jihadi content. There is an agreement on the need to reinforce its capabilities in order to reach its full potential, so act to proactive monitoring terrorist propaganda regardless of the ideology. In May this year, we coordinated the first referral action day against right wing terrorist online propaganda in which 28 EU member states and international partners participated. Over 1,000 items hosted in more than 170 platforms were collected and assessed for referral to request to the online service provider for the review against them in terms of service to be posteriorly in, in a later stage taken down. Importantly, the knowledge and expertise deriving from this project represented a major building block in Europol's effort to expand our capabilities to address the online dimension of right-wing violent extremism and terrorism. Furthermore, to respond to this evolving need, the expansion of the mandate of our analysis project Check the Web, currently limited to jihadist online propaganda, will cover non-jihadist um, propaganda, and this has been already approved and it will enter soon in the implementation phase. In our current scope, the analysis project Check the Web contributes to preventing and combating jihadist terrorism by sharing the analysis regarding Islamist extremist use of the internet. A particular focus takes place on websites, statements, videos, and written publication of jihadist terrorist organization 
published on the internet. Although still we are in the capacity building phase, we are planning to proactive monitor right-wing content by 2022, provided uh, sufficient staff allocation, and at a later stage also to focus on left-wing extremist content. Notable the results regarding the takedown of terrorist content online have been achieved in the framework of the EU Internet Forum. Next to this cooperation with the companies based on a voluntary approach, as mentioned by Mike De before, a swift implementation of the terrorist content online regulation will be of paramount importance in this regard. Europol is supporting member states in their 12 month preparation to implement the TCO regulation, including providing a technical solution to ensure the coordination at EU level for a proper deconfliction of content. Further boosting of our EU Internet Referral Unit as an integral part of the European Counterterrorism Center, ECTC, is one of the key priorities of Europol. A further step will be made with the Digital Service Act in the coming years. Europol follows closely the, the developments from an internal security perspective, and we are ready to contribute with subject matter expertise and proposals for technical solutions. To conclude, this is a very complex topic requiring a strong cross-sectoral commitments. The divergent legal system present in uh, different EU countries to combat uh, hate in the EU, it's a big challenge for all of us. Having said this, there is an agreement on the need to reinforce Europol's capabilities to combat online anti-Semitic motivated terrorism and violent extremism in coordination with EU member states. The current revision of our legal framework aims at reinforcing Europol's role in the EU and the global security architecture. For instance, it improves the framework for cooperation with private parties and recognizes Europol's role in the field of research and innovation, which is an important milestone and reflects Europol's strategic priority to be at the front for, at the forefront of law enforcement innovation and research. Thank you very much, and I will be more than happy to uh, reply any question. Thank you. Bien, eh, señor García Morales, muchísimas gracias por Mr. su Mr. García Morales, thank you so much for your intervention. You have been uh, talking about the violent radicalization, which are in those two elements of the pillars that go from prejudice all the way up, escalating up to structured hate, which is the one that you are analyzing and combating. We have two questions from Mrs. Keller that are for the speakers. So please, I think the best is that you can ask the questions yourself. Yes, thank you, Maite. Hats off to you for this webinar. How? Can the European Parliament support you in your fight, in your fight against hatred and hatred online? And then we have had this debate several times at the European level. Where should we put the limit between taking away this contact? Uh, this content, heinous content, and then, well, this question of freedom of speech to which we are deeply attached. And as you have explained, well, this is very sensitive because, well, this freedom allows the most extreme world to, uh, well, um, go far too far. So where, how can we strike a balance there? Bien. Bien. Yo mismo. Vamos a ver, este debate es un debate también muy antiguo, que ya en los 90... This is a very old debate, actually, in the 90s we discussed these issues in many meetings and we had a slogan at the time, freedom of expression doesn't mean freedom of aggression. Freedom of expression is a very broad concept, indeed. And articles uh, 30 and 29 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 
already sets limits so as not to use the proclaimed freedoms and liberties in the Declaration in a way that it can vulnerate the liberties and freedoms of everybody else. And this is how all the international treaties deal with this. And this has been taken to the penal court. In our country, we have very objective, very um, limited objectives with uh, concepts such as hostility, direct and indirect incitement, provocation, incitement to hate, hostility, and violence. Therefore, we needed some clarification by the General Prosecutor's Office in our country. The main objective was to avoid a bad uh, environment that will be likely to have more violence. And this is very important. If I create an atmosphere of intolerance, an environment where tomorrow any individual, a group or an organization takes advantage of this environment to perpetrate an, perpetrate an attack, then the author of the speech has the responsibility. We already had made a reform of the penal law and we organized a campaign at the time. We didn't have the internet or the social network, but we had walls, banners, and the possibility to, to write messages on banners. And we had a campaign. And, the, and there, was, there was a sentence, a terrible sentence, saying something like uh, constant beating to migrants. And I denounced this. And um, we, we didn't know if violent action had been provoked. But in that slogan, people were in, incited to beat up the migrants. So we thought this had to be denounced. It wasn't included in the penal court. In 2015, the penal code was reformed and this limitation was, was added, direct or indirect incitement. And now, social media is concerned that we you can put proofs to this incitement to create a certain environment or to go against the penal code. I may also maybe provide some answer. I am on French now, so I suppose there is no technical issue whatsoever now. I hope there is no technical issue for the interpreters nor for the French-speaking public. So, Madame Keller, your question is very timely, very interesting and debate, debated quite a lot uh, and it has been tackled for quite some years. Indeed, the questions of the limits of freedom of expression is critical. First of all, as it has already been said, uh, freedom of expression has some limits and these limits are defined by dignity and equality of all people. The measures which are used and adopted to limit freedom of expression, according to the European Court of Human Rights, need to be proportional and have a specific aim in order to aim for equality, in order, well, to protect people. Furthermore, heinous speech and hatred is important from a criminal law point of view and civil law point of view. Furthermore, 
It is also very important from a societal point of view because some part of this speech cannot be condemned by law and it needs to be prevented because this type of speech uh, can be relevant from a criminal and criminal uh, and legal point of view as well. Then the Avia law was criticized uh, on, on this. But you shall note that the spirit of the German law hasn't been criticized at all. So it is important to rem recall that the uh, this kind of speech is not the same depending on the person who pronounces such speeches and depending on the potential victim. If I, as a representative of the Council of Europe, I use some kind of speech, well, obviously this speech can have an impact because I represent the Council, because it is on the Internet and because well, all of this gives strength in a certain way to my speech. But if we were having a na nice glass of wine, both of us together, and well, just talking, having small talk, it would be very different. All of this to say that this dimension is very important, and we need to bear in mind, well, the uh, the person who pronounces uh, a given speech and also the person who is victim of said speech. Furthermore, this debate has been used by the court and case law. People who went to the Open Court of Human Rights were haters Indeed, sometimes politicians, far-right politicians whom you may very well know in France and also Belgium, said that national law had punished them and impeded them from uh, exercising their freedom of speech. But lately some victims also went to the European Court of Human Rights saying that these speeches had viola violated their rights to have a family, their rights to privacy. So, lately, these are no longer the people who are using hate speech, but the people who are victims of hate speech. And dignity, equality and private life is being restricted because of hate speech. So, in my opinion, the law needs to be very accurate, especially uh, criminal law, while sanctioning uh, uh, those uh, hate speech. The definition can be different if there is a criminal sanction, for example, if there is a public dimension to the crime, to the phenomenon, but they can also have other dimensions, and these can be sanctioned, sanctioned or repressed in another manner. And once again, I do think, and I conclude by this, that the European Parliament can support the European Commission in its definition exercise of those hate speeches that need to be punished and repressed through criminal law. I do think that there is a big work to be done in defining hate speech. Finally, I do think that the European Parliament can show the, um, the right way in its uh, parliamentary debate and discussions. Some words should not be used. Uh, 
self-regulation, a code of conduct should prevail, it would need to be approved in order to show the right example when it comes to all of that. Thank you very much for your attention. Bien, señor Valenti, que sepa usted que Mr. Nuestro... Valenti, our group has presented an amendment on the creation of this uh, code of self-regulation. We hope that this will open its way. So your idea has been echoed by our group as an amendment with a series of recommendations. So we are fully in line with you. And Ms. Mr. Garcia Morales, do you have a practical suggestion for ourselves as MEPs for our work in the Civil Liberties Commission? Thank you very much for your question. Well, throughout the experience that we have gathered in this field, we know how to regulate content and we focus on, on the type of content that encourages violence, that is calling to perpetrate violent and terrorist attacks. My referral unit deals with uh, the fight against terrorism at Europol. We focus our work on terrorist uh, content. And in terms of uh, freedom of expression, we are very meticulous because unfortunately there is so much hostile content that could be catalogized as terrorist or inciting to violence that we don't only focus on speeches, that can be questioned by the far right or the far left. We we'll focus on the content that is uh, actively calling to, to be violent. This could be a criminal offense or apology to terrorism. At the same time, apart from establishing safeguards and and all the transparency in Europol, all the content that we report to the operators is assessed once again by the teams of uh, uh, abuse control. And on a, on, a, on a voluntary basis, and knowing the code of practice, they take the voluntary decision if this content has to be withdrawn or not. Take a recourse to the freedom of expression. This is a decision that takes place after the assessment of the teams of um, abuse of content, abusive content. So we need to identify these texts, this content, and from June on, with the new regulation, the countries, the competent authorities will have to sign a legal authorization through a prosecutor, through a magistrate. They will report their removal orders different from the referrals. My unit is called the Internet Referral Unit. A referral is a communication of a content that the platform has to analyze, assess, and it is the responsibility of the platform to decide whether to withdraw the content or not. With a new regulation that will come in force in June, the competent authorities will send directly to the operators a report trying not to damage investigations. We need to make sure that investigations in a member state do not damage investigations in a different member state. So the Internet providing companies will have an hour to eliminate the content if a legal authority of a member state determines this content to be illegal. And this is the new information flow that will be operational as of June. Thank you very much. Yes, Fabienne. Is 
going to uh, give us the conclusions of this event, and we thank her very much indeed. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank you all warmly, very sincerely, you all the panelists, for your takes on such an important topic, the upsurge of hate in all societies. Maite, it was your idea. You are deeply committed in those efforts and we are losing Madame Keller, unfortunately. Her connection is really poor. You have been working for many years on that issue, and I would like also to welcome the work of Mr. Ibarra, Esteban Ibarra, who is deeply committed in his fight, in his struggle. So I wanted to pay tribute to your commitment, to your efforts in fighting hate so that we can make sure that uh, we evolve in our societies. And of course, there are constraints and we are living in a polarized world, uh, Maite, that, uh, as you are describing very often. And uh, clearly, where our democratic uh, mechanism have less uh, take, less grip, let's say, and it's difficult as well to um, explain the impact of those. I would like also to explain to thank Mr. Valenti for his explanations on the uh, work of the Council of Europe. And I really um, I'm really looking forward to your joint work with the Council of Europe. We are both uh, democratic bodies of uh, Europe and uh, as of both institutions are gathered regularly in Strasbourg, we should have more synergies because our work is com can be is complementary. I would like to thank Mr. Garcia uh, Morales because you are actually doing the pragmatic work and your task is huge by withdrawing online content. Maite was a clearly pushing the official reporter. She really wished for this regulation to be a uh, success. Uh, she uh, worked tirelessly in negotiations uh, to make sure that it is really efficient. And there is a next step. This is the Digital Services Act, a regulation. And we lost Madame Keller. So it is about uh, platforms and IT systems. It won't only be focusing on terrorist content. We need to find legal pathways in order to ensure there is a definition. Clearly, I would like to congratulate all of you, commend you all for your work. Thank you, Maite, for your involvement. It is a very important work and clearly through different uh, legislative proposals in all uh, in the commission uh, going in the same direction we are striving in order to be more efficient in order to prevent the most dangerous violence and hate manifestations and forms as they are developing in our societies thank you to you all and i give you back the floor mighty for the very last word very well. Thank you very much. Dear Fabien, you're far too generous and kind. We both share a passion for freedom, liberties, a healthy rule of law. And we know that sadly, if our minds abandon the idea of uh, pluralism, in ideology and fall into dogmatism and polarization, our societies are going to lose so many possibilities to have a bright future and to defend their rights and interests. We wanted to call you here, to gather you here, to learn from you. We are going to keep on working. And now is the time to say goodbye with a lot of gratitude. It's been an honor. Fabian will stay together. A big hug to everybody.